Sean Connery, Roger Moore, Timothy Dalton, Pierce Brosnan. De geschiedenis van James Bond in een notendop. En toch was er ooit nog een Bond die in de late jaren 60 één keer aantrad en daarna een beetje tragisch in het niets verdween. Lazenby, George Lazenby. Nu deze week de twintigste officiële Bondfilm Die Another Day over de hele wereld in première gaat, alleen Nederland moet nog even wachten, nemen wij u mee naar de enige geheime agent 007 die echt een goed bewaard geheim gebleven is. Goedenavond. De figuur van 007 werd geboren in 1952 toen Ian Fleming zijn eerste bondboek schreef, Casino Royale. Maar een rage werd hij pas in de jaren 60, toen de Koude Oorlog ons een fascinatie bijgebracht had met geheime diensten en de high-tech industrie de ene blitse uitvinding na de andere deed. Laserstralen, televisie in de auto, telex in een polshorloge, het prikkelde de fantasie allemaal geweldig. In 1962 kwam de eerste bond op film, Dr. No, meteen al met Sean Connery. En ook al leek zijn bond maar half op die van Fleming, het publiek ging plat. Er kwam James Bond speelgoed op de markt, plakplaatjes, poppen, attaché-koffers met telescoopvizier en plastic dolken in de voering. En Sean Connery ging op voor een tweede film en een derde, een vierde. Tot hij zo met het karakter voor zelf raakte dat hij nergens anders meer op aangesproken werd en er de pest in kreeg. Na zijn vijfde You Only Live Twice liet hij weten dat dit echt zijn laatste was. Bij de voorbereidingen van nummer 6 gaf dat een heel nieuwe situatie. Te meer daar hij ook een nieuwe regisseur zou krijgen, Peter Hunt. Die nooit eerder een hele film geregisseerd had, maar wel de montage had gedaan van alle Bond-films tot dan toe. En eigenwijs genoeg was om het dit keer anders aan te willen pakken. Levensechter, meer verhalend, minder leeg spektakel. En aan hem was nu de taak om bij die nieuwe aanpak ook een nieuwe steracteur te vinden. En te laten zien wat lang niet iedereen in die tijd zich kon voorstellen. Dat er na Sean Connery nog leven was voor een nieuwe Bond. The new Bond. The different 007. On Her Majesty's Secret Service. I went through this film with a copy of the paperback book here in this hand. The whole time. And I continually referred back to the book. And I'm pleased to say that a number of people have said, that's what's so great. You follow the book. And I did. Mainly because it's such a good story and it's such a good book. That's why it's the best Bond film. <laughs> If you can't beat them, join them. If you're scared to fight it out, watch him and watch out. They're paperback books. Fleming wrote them at the end of the war, really. It was the 50s, of course, when he wrote them. And the war had only been over a short while. And we were still just getting over, um, you know, utility things and Earth's at things and rationing was still on in Great Britain. So we were coming out of that. And the young people, unlike today, uh, were beginning to put on suits and nice ties and shirts. Bond. James Bond. All the young people going to work in the train, coming home, red in the train in order to give themselves a little, you know, imaginative release. My name's Bond, James Bond. I wanted to make something that was um, a very good story and had relationship and wasn't just um, exciting chases and gimmicks and, and what we've come to learn as James Bond tricks. I wanted a relationship and I had and on a magic secret service had that. I love you. I know I'll never find another girl like you. George was a, a what do you call, commercial artist. He'd done a very popular big fry chocolate, carrying a large box of chocolates. You big fry picnic, big fry size, big fry value. But big he looked fry very good. Big fry, I'm by. Big fry. Uh, I was an Australian rascal, running around London having a good time. And I decided to stay. Uh, 
because I uh, broke into the modeling business by selling a car to a, car, to a uh, photographer when I was a car salesman. And he uh, took some pictures of me and by chance a very good photographer picked up on them and gave me a job and then I was famous overnight. We wanted somebody with the sexual power or, or prominence of a Sean. Um, you know, a very presentable young man. Of Sean Connery. Sean Connery, yeah. Bond. James Bond. Of course, we would never get a Sean Connery, because there's only one, but we could get near it. My name's Bond. James Bond. So I went to a barber shop, like where Sean Connery went. And I said, cut my hair like Sean Connery's. And then uh, I found out where he got his suits made. I went there. They had one that he hadn't picked up. I got slightly longer arms. I got the suit. I got the watch. I've got the haircut. We saw hundreds of young actors of possible stature and background for the parts as if you were casting an ordinary part. And then we tested those that we thought might work or might be possible in some way, uh, which was the only way to start, the only way to do it. There was all uh, physical stuff. It was rolling around the grass with Patsy, you know, doing a love scene, uh, swimming in a swimming pool. And I was a good swimmer. I could do that, you know, brought up and straight on the beaches. There was nothing for me. I'd dive in one end of the pool and come up the other end of the water. And then he said, for God's sake, stay above the water so we can see you. <laughs> you know, so I'd swim up and down. And, and then he had me jumping fences. Like, he said, just go over and put your hands on this fence and jump over. I didn't even put my hands on it. I just jump over it. I, could, I was a high jumper at school, so it's no big deal. And ride horses. I jumped on a horse and rode it bareback. They said they wanted to put the saddle on it. I said, forget the saddle, just jumped on it and rode it, you know, until the thing ran out of steam. I did, <coughs> what, two, three weeks? Weeks, not all together, not one week after another or one day after another, um, testing with George Lazenby. And then I personally cut them together. I shot scenes with him, different sorts of scenes. Scenes with girls, scenes with fights, uh, all sorts of activity to see how he worked. Over. Over. Five, sixteen, take three. All right, action. Ooh. Okay, cut it. He was the number one choice in the end when it came down to looking at all these various people. Were you surprised? Very surprised, because I'd never acted before. I'd never spoken in front of a camera in my life. And I had a very Australian accent, because I never tried to change it. I just talked like an Australian guy from the bush, you know? Well, that was one of the problems. That was a bit of a difficulty. But I sent him to a speech. He, you know, he had this very, had a broader Australian accent than I suspect he's got today. <laughs> but um, that was what we did. We sent him to a speech trainer and a wonderful woman. It took me a while to get it, but she had me laying on the floor with a, a match in my mouth, you know, holding my mouth over, and foot on my stomach saying, you've got to breathe from here. You know. And uh, it was quite fun. My name's Bond. James Bond. My name's Bond. James Bond. The new star. The different Bond. The name's Lazenby. George Lazenby. What are the strong points of George Lazenby? Well, I think it is, in fact, that he's a good, straight, upright, handsome-looking guy. He was very handsome in those days. And, and could move very well. He moved into a room. You saw him move in my film, you know, down those stairs and into the, into the casino. You look at him, your eye goes to him. Do you remember the first time you met your, let's say, co-star or the Bond girl? Yes. I was quite happy with Diana Rigg. I mean, she was a great actress and beautiful, and I thought, this is uh, going to be wonderful, you know, working with an experienced actress. 
How did you feel? I mean, she was a classically trained actress. I know, but you know what? I was dumb enough not to be intimidated. Arrogant enough, whatever you want to say. I felt I'm as good as they are. She was the one who made it all work. Which one are you thinking of? I'm thinking in the barn, <clears throat> you know, the, the love barn. scene, the, the proposal of marriage hadn't been for her. I mean, she made that whole thing work. You mean it? I mean it. How did she do that? By her professionalism, by her complete stagecraft, I would say. <laughs> she was just wonderful in it. How, how does she it... Made able to, well, she was able to give him confidence and carry him through and bring him out, where she's lying there with him. I'm not. I can't do that. <laughs> but she can, you know. And some actresses would do it and some wouldn't. But she was wonderful with him. What kind of James Bond did you want to portray? Well, the script told me this. At the end, he has to show that he's in love. Now, how can a man fall in love who's not sensitive? You know, all due respects, Connery used women as shields, as, you know, wet, you know as, to make, you know, just to satisfy himself. Love him and leave him. I had to get hooked by a woman. So to go from a cold Connery type to being in love was tough, I thought. So to start off being a little more open, more emotional, would make it easier for me to transfer, transform into the love part. Look, you don't owe me a thing. I think you're in some sort of trouble. Would you like to talk about it? No, Mr. Bond. The only thing you need know about me is that I pay my debts. Luck came into play with the Pitts Gloria. It was written by Fleming, I don't know if you know the, remember the book, as if that place had been built for us. was the production manager of the film. There must be someone who sits overall and looks at everything. Well, first of all, I found the location here, which is quite important, because the location certainly has a great impact on the involving costs. the end of one day having looked around and we were having a drink at the bar and my production manager came across to me and said I've just been on the telephone to somebody a friend of mine who's in Murren, a place called Murren and uh, they're building uh, the Schilton bomb they're building this great ski resort at the top of the Schilton and he said what he tells me it sounds like what we're looking for I can't believe it. Anyway, the next day we were going to look at some other location. I said to him, go and look at this location. You know more or less what we're for trying to find. And if there's a chance, if you think that it may look like something we're trying to find, give us a call. And when I saw it, I knew I had found it. And I went up and I met the manager here. And after I said that we had planned to start eventually a James Bond film here. He was quite enthusiastic. I think we, the film invested up on Pitts Gloria about three million Swiss francs, which at that time was a lot of money. What was your relationship with George Lazenby? He was very difficult because he was unsecure and people who are unsecure camouflage themselves by being 
the big show off. And uh, he wasn't a colleague, and the crew hated him. And uh, I could give you an example. One morning came to the bar and wanted a coffee. And there was another man before, and the waiter was from Austria, and he it said, don't you know me that I'm, I'm James Bond? And this man said, and I'm Paul from Innsbruck. And that finished it. Did you have lots of contact during the shoot with with George? Yeah, you started. Not a lot, no. Not once we started shooting. It wasn't the time. But a normal amount of contact. He got sulky once or twice and used to sit in his caravan and say, nobody loves me and all that sort of thing. You know, I mean, he was a typical... He got very insecure at times. So there were times when you had to love him and times when you had to say, now, come on, George, come on the floor and look and see what we're doing. Because I can't be here in the caravan with you when I'm supposed to be down there making this into a good film. How was the cooperation with Peter Hunt? Well, that was, uh, that was unfortunate. We were on a big set and they were doing a dolly shot and a lot of wires and stuff being moved around and Peter had three of his friends over. And Peter wasn't on the set and the first assistant, Frank, uh, whatever, I forget, Frank, someone, said, geez, these people are getting in everyone's way. He said, George, do us a favor and just say, anybody who's not needed on the set, can you please clear it? So I, I, being the star, could say that, or the first assistant could say it. But he didn't want to upset the director, so he got me to say it. I didn't know who I was clearing. I just said, anyone not needed on the set, please clear. Next thing I know, Peter Hunt's not talking to me. That's not true at all. He never cleared the set. He, would, he couldn't have cleared the set. Well, he asked it's those, not his prerogative to do so. He asked those people to leave the set. He says. Well, I don't know anything about And they were a friend of yours, and you, 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 were, you, you didn't like him doing that. Nothing. And you never spoke to him afterwards. No, it's not true. <laughs> no one can get us together. And uh, I asked him, I tried to ask him what's going on. He said, don't, uh, leave me alone. And anything that was said between Peter and I was handed down from assistant to me. And I would uh, throw a party, he wouldn't come. Or if he knew I was going to be somewhere, he wouldn't go there. How long did that last? Till the film finished. No, no, can't be. Couldn't possibly be. How could we work together if I didn't speak to him? Couldn't possibly be. No. And I certainly have never... No, there was never a problem like that. Never a problem. No. No, he has, he has various fanciful ideas, but it's not true. I think he'd have liked me to have been with him a lot more and hold his hand, but I couldn't. I was too busy doing to my own film. But it never at any time he could come and talk to me all the time. I did. Often. The object was to shoot a spectacular avalanche. And we found this place here where we are standing right now. We loaded the helicopter with 150 kilograms of, of explosive and a friend of mine threw them out of the glacier. And for seconds later, the whole thing started to come down. What did the Swiss think when you made an avalanche here? Well, my, my friends or the experts said, we should go to the Lauterbrunn Valley and not talk. Just shoot. Just and, do it. And just do it. And, and, and Alfred, who was the double of James Bond, made the famous comment. He said, if you ask many questions, you get many answers. So? And this is what we did. Better we did not, not ask no. questions. And do it. Can you still see what happened then? Yes, you can see that the glacier is there and where we blew it off there are crevices of eight or nine meters high. So you did this? Yes. Do you regret doing it? No, no, we didn't do any harm whether this glacier is up there or not, who cares?
Blofeld. It's Blofeld. When she gets shot, we were in Portugal, the top of that thing there. And I've got a non-actor who's got a breakdown, which worried me because I thought, how is George ever going to do this? And I brought him out to the set very early on. I talked to him and I said, you know, this is a very important scene. This is the last scene in the film. And I want you to really think about it, you know, and go through it in your own mind. I want you to be here. He told everyone to keep away from me. He said, the more alone he is, the better he is. And he was wonderful. He was absolutely wonderful. He did it beautifully. And I, I was delighted. It was marvelous. But that is an illustration of where well, you do something a bit mean in order to make him, you know, shine. You're doing it for his benefit. <laughs> and the film, of course. scene, uh, the first take, I got two takes at it, because the first one I cried and tears came out. And he said, no tears, James Bond doesn't cry. So the second take wasn't as strong, but he used it. I don't think I did, actually. That's his version. I don't think I did. I took the first take. He says, in the first, uh, I cried. Well, not quite. He nearly cries in the second. But uh, I'm not so sure that we wanted James Bond to actually cry. Nowadays, maybe it would have worked, but in that time, it wasn't. The second take I did only as a cover, because he was so good in the first take. Now, he says he cried. In his mind, I hope he did think he cried, because it showed through. I didn't have to have whales of water. It went through, and if you look at that scene, you'll see. He is very upset. He is very emotional about this. It's why he should be. It's wonderful. And it's rather stunning. In fact, the big complaints I get is, why did you want to end a James Bond film like that? Because, you know, with a bullet hole. And I wanted to end it like that in order to make an impact, to make a shock, and not have it all fun and games. Het kogelgat. Een prachtig slot en daarmee na zo'n negen maanden draaien, negen maanden van voortdurend oplopende spanningen, eind goed, al goed. Zo leek het althans voor Hunt als regisseur en hij begon tevreden aan het knip- en plakwerk van de montage. Maar achter zijn rug ging het gedonder rond zijn nieuwe steracteur vervolgens onverminderd door en nu zelfs in het openbaar. In afwachting van de première bleek de impulsieve Lazenby er door een vriend van overtuigd te zijn dat zo'n James Bond met zijn gelikte glamour eigenlijk passé was. Het was 1969 in de bioscoop het jaar van Easy Rider, ronkende motoren, ruige kerels, daar ging het naartoe. En in een persbericht liet Lazenby daarom vast weten dat hij voor een tweede Bond niet in de markt was. Dit tot ontzetting van de producenten Harry Zoltzman en Albert Broccoli. Want Afgezien van die beslissing, wat was dat nou voor reclame voor On His Majesty's Secret Service? Maar Lazenby had daar klaarblijkelijk een broertje dood aan en maakte het nog erger. In de interviews waarin hij zich als nieuwe bond mocht komen voorstellen, begon hij breed uit te vertellen over de problemen op de set. Niet eens die met hand, maar nog pikanter met zijn tegenspeelster Diana Rigg. En mocht het publiek toen nog niet afgeschrikt zijn, dan was er tenslotte de première. Met een dapper lachende Diana Rigg en daarnaast haar James Bond. In smoking, zoals het hoort, maar met half lang haar ineens. En een ruige baard, solliciterend naar een heel andere rol. What about the reports that you were deliberately awkward and hostile? Yeah, well, they, they were true in a way because I was very uptight lots of, uh, lots of the times because I didn't understand exactly what was going on. One of the biggest examples of that so-called hostility was the very much publicized rift between you and your co-star Diana Rigg. Now, what was the truth behind that? 
Well, it was, uh, there were some guys standing around the ice rink and she was having a drink and... She kept us all waiting in the ice while her and Peter Hunt were drinking champagne. Of course, I wasn't invited because Peter was there. And I could see them through the window. Uh, and the crew are all out there, you know, stomping around on the ice. And so uh, when she got in the car, I went for her. And she jumped out of the car and said, he's attacking me in the car. You know, went on. And uh, I just called her so-and-so for, you know, not considering the crew freezing their butts off out there. She couldn't drive the car properly, and I got into her about her drinking, that's, you know, and things like that. And she, and it wasn't that at all, she felt sick that night. And I was, I was at fault by getting into her, but it was just, I think everyone gets upset at some time. We can get out there. If you say so. They try and put out, they try and put out a whole idea that it wasn't very successful. It's not true at all. It was very successful in its day particularly. And of course since then, since then they've all gone on to be even more successful. So it's very difficult to assess. But it wasn't a, it wasn't a dead film, it wasn't a dull film. I don't do anything to do with James Bond without getting paid for it. I've made that decision in my head because I've paid for it. I had to live my life as a one-time James Bond after the, after the uh, film. And it's a costly thing. It is. It's a constant job. I mean, I can hear people when they go past. You know who that is? Who? He's that guy, you know. Tarzan, wasn't he? No. Wasn't he Tarzan? He was in Star Trek. No, it's a James Bond guy. You know, I'm getting all this all the time, and it's just a fuzz throughout life. The nasleep van a kort leven als geheim agent. Want Lazenby mag dan gedacht hebben dat James Bond passé was en dat er voor hem nog wel iets mooiers lag te wachten. De ironie is dat precies het omgekeerde het geval bleek. Lazenby viel na zijn eenmalige sterroptreden terug in marginale rolletjes en na een paar jaar zelfs dat niet meer. Terwijl James Bond de golven van de tijd bleef trotseren. In de lange rij van Bond films is hij met Lazenby sindsdien bekend gebleven als een buitenbeentje. Eigenaardig slot, eigenaardige held. Maar desondanks, wie weet juist daardoor geldt on His Majesty's Secret Service bij de kenners als een van de toppers in de reeks. Een van de weinigen die af en toe weer in relatie komen, wat de lage opbrengst van het eerste jaar nog aardig opkrikt. En zo kunt u hem toevallig deze week zien in het Amsterdamse Filmmuseum, van donderdag tot en met zondag. Dan tot slot, mocht u al een kenner zijn, dan zult u weten dat regisseur Peter Hunt onlangs overleed. Het interview dat wij met hem hadden was drie weken voor zijn dood zijn laatste. Dit was Andere Tijden. Terug naar de onze.